Hi everybody, uh, this is Alberto Aguilera from One Academy. We are here uh, very, very excited this afternoon because we have a very uh, talentful and successful swimmer and human being. We are, we're gonna be talking to Carlin uh, Pipes. I met her in April in Colombia in an international uh, master swimming meet and she was the keynote swimmer. You know, you have keynote speakers. She was the keynote swimmer. And I, I, I talked to her a little bit and wow, her story was so compelling that I, I, I couldn't wait to share it with you guys. So knowing that I bring you to all of you, Miss, uh, Mrs. Carlin Pipes. Well, aloha and thank you so much, Alberto, for having me um, on your podcast here. And we are filming quite a bit earlier than the nine o'clock time because I'm in beautiful British Columbia where I am visiting my husband. I married a Canadian, but I happen to live in Kona, Hawaii. So I am very grateful to um, be able to experience many wonderful places in this world as I swim and teach and including uh, my trip to Colombia. Uh, and uh, also we'll be, you and I will be connecting this week in Orlando. Exactly. We'll be here having a lot of fun in the Pan Am Master Championship. Uh, so we can start, um, uh, Carlin, can you talk to us a little bit about your beginning as a swimmer, as a child? And you yeah. start well, you know, as you know, everybody has a story. And uh, growing up, um, I was uh, the fourth of five children. And um, my mother was all under the age of seven. So it was a very chaotic household. But what made it even more um, unstable and chaotic was that my dad was an alcoholic and he drank regularly, creating all kinds of embarrassing situations and basically either uh, making us embarrassed or being not connected to us as children. And so when I first took my first swimming lesson at age four, when I got in the water, it was like, Everything that I didn't get at home, I found that I got at the YMCA. I got attention. I got appreciation from the swim instructors who told me what a great job I did. I felt accepted. And so, and then I felt warm. The water was very, very warm and I was a skinny kid. So it, it like hit every, it was my, it was my happy place. And I just loved watching uh, the faces of my instructors as I improved even more and quickly. And I just, I, I improved, improved very rapidly rapidly. So age four or five, by the time I was age six, I was invited to join the swimming team. And I remember take, doing my very first swimming race. And of course, we didn't have goggles back then. We, we, you know, just swam in this blurry, wet, watery environment. And I remember diving in and, and just, you know, hurling yourself off the swimming blocks to a gun, no less. And and just swimming as hard as I could and hitting the wall and then just looking up and everybody was so excited and I'd, I'd won a, a, a second place ribbon and I knew, wow, this is, this is my place to be. This is where I want to be. So swimming for me um, came easily. It was something that satisfied a lot of my needs that weren't being met at home and um, I was pretty good at it. Great. Uh, I, I, I think you told me before that you were uh, very successful as a, as a young uh, to, uh, in your um, sc school and uh, college? Well, uh, backing up just a little bit. So at, at age six, I was pretty good, but I wasn't very good compared to the people on the team. And But by the in two years, I'd, I'd, I'd clawed my way to the top of that pile. And then we moved. We moved to San Diego, and that was into a very large uh, city where there were a lot of really good swimmers. So I went from being a very good swimmer to just a very average swimmer. But within four years, I had clawed my way to the top of that team. And then we moved again. And But this time, the team that we joined was a, a team that was coached by Mike Troy, who had won a gold medal in the 1960 Olympics. And not only did we have an Olympic coach, but we actually had Olympians on our team. So needless to say, I was a big fish in a little pond on my last team. And once again, I was back down to being just a, a tiny little tadpole uh, with these Olympic athletes. I mean, you don't get any higher than that. And uh, true to my nature, I fought pretty hard. And by the time I was age 15, I was a junior national champion in the 400 medley. 
uh, you know, a very difficult event. Um, what happened at that point in time was when I had that great success, I also had my first alcoholic drink. And when I first had my drink, you know, one thing I got to say is, you know, growing up, I swore I would never be like my dad. But as soon as I had that first alcoholic buzz, that feeling, that release, that the pressure release, I knew I wanted the liquid of the bottle and not the liquid of the pool. And so at age 15, I went from being an all in swimmer to get me the heck out of this pool. I don't want anything to do with it. I want to go get buzzed. And that was kind of the start of my, uh, my journey. You know? Well, and how long you've been in that uh, down spiral? Well, you know, at age 15, um, I was also invited that year to go to the Olympic Training Center, uh, the very first ever class. I turned it down. I mean, here you you have a coach and a mom and people that have, you know, uh, pushed you and supported you uh, financially, emotionally, time wise. And you get to a pinnacle of your young career and you turn it down. You don't even care. You don't. It's like, I don't want to go. That's going to be really hard. I, I want to go have fun. I, the confines of the pool were too restrictive for me. I wanted to be out. I wanted to experience a teenage life. And and that included drinking. But what happened is it became a huge battle between my coach, my mom, and myself. They wanted me to swim. I wanted out. And uh, sometimes I won. Sometimes they won. But it seemed like I was always getting into trouble only because I didn't go to training. And so my life was based on trying to hide and sneak and lie uh, to get out of going to training. Um, and that weighs pretty heavily on a teenage mind because you're just living a lie, you know. Uh, the other thing that I acquired at that time was an eating disorder. So I uh, had and found out about bulimia where you binge and purge. And so in addition to my drinking, which is when I would kind of get out of control, the, the binging and purging was a way to stay in control. So I had like two addictions that were two sides of the coin and they both fed off each other. So um, yeah, during my teens, late teens, it was really horrible. So um, at age 18, I was able to go to university on a full swimming scholarship. But uh, something that's very interesting about people with problems with addictions is they think that by leaving where they are, that they'll leave their problems behind. It's called a geographical. In other words, I don't like who I am here, so I'm going to go someplace else, and hopefully my problems won't follow me. Well, as you know, that doesn't work, and uh, within a year and a half, I'd been kicked out of a university, and uh, for the next um, 11 years, I basically just created this downward spiral where... Um, I would uh, get jobs, get fired. I would start school and drop out. I would um, make all these false promises to get back in the water and take advantage of this wonderful talent that I had, which indeed is a talent. Um, but I, I, I didn't, uh, I never would follow through. And, and the more that I quit, the less I trusted myself. And the less I trusted myself, the more I hated myself. And the more I hated myself, of course, the more I drank. And so by the time I was age 31, I was um, a shut-in alcoholic drinking a liter of vodka a day and waiting to die. Wow. Wow. Uh, you have mentioned some words that in my, in my field of work, uh, we talk a lot, a lot about. It's about that it doesn't matter how talented you are. It's more about the way you feel what happens around you and the, the, your attitude uh, 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 to what happens around you. And, and, and it's amazing because sometimes people, it doesn't get that bad to people, you know? They, yeah. they just don't accomplish what they want or they, don't ju they just don't get successful. But in your case, it was very, very, wow, um, impactful. Let me ask you something. How do you rebound? What happened that you were able to come back? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it wasn't really all my doing. Uh, um, my mom is a very strong person and, and she was the one that was always pushing me to swim uh, for, for better or for worse. Uh, but, um, you know, I think a lot of times parents are, and, and, and uh, wives and husbands and kids were in, they're in denial that the problem is that bad. And here's the message that I would love to say about people that have addictions. If you're seeing somebody with behavior that looks addictive and whether, I mean, and it could be just about anything, but what you're seeing is probably just the very tip of the iceberg because the rest of it has been hidden. 
So I gave to the rest of the world a, a very different vibe that I was okay. But inside, man, I was a mess. And to the point where, I mean, I just really didn't care if I would ever wake up again. Uh, and what happened is my mom intervened and she took me to a doctor. And, and I, of course, knowing that I was going to go to a doctor, I had to tell her that I was an alcoholic. And, and I swear it was the hardest thing in the world to have those words come out of my mouth because it was just so reminiscent of my father. I mean, it meant that I had ultimately failed. And now I know very differently that, you know, being in a disease or an addiction is not a failure. It's only a failure if you die. If you get help and ask for help and, and move forward to change, then that's a success. And so my mom intervened. I went to a 10-day rehab and I suffered horribly as my body detoxed and, and uh, got away from the alcohol. But the one thing, it's really, Alberto, it's very interesting. When I was in the middle of this, I mean, when you're going through the delirium tremors, you're throwing up, you're shaking, you're convulsing, you're having um, hallucinations, like things are coming after you to kill you in your hospital bed. And in the middle of this, I'm thinking, you know, I just want to die. Or actually what I thought was I want to drink because if I could drink, then I knew that the feeling, this horrible feeling would go away, but that wouldn't last very long. They wouldn't let me leave. <laughs> I had to stay. And, but there was this little, as soon as I kind of got just a little bit better, maybe after about three days of pure suffering, there was a little bit of hope for the first time in so many years. I mean, when you have no hope, you have nothing. When you have just the tiniest measure of hope, you have the whole world. And I had that little hope. And Alberta, you know what that hope, where it came from? I drew upon my experience in those really hard workouts I had when I was a teenager growing up. I mean, Mike Troy, we did 10 200s butterfly, which is really, really hard, long course meters. And I drew upon the strength that it's like, man, if I could get through that kind of workout and get to the end of that, I can certainly get through this. And, you know, I just drew upon the fact that I was a swimmer and it meant something. And I had stepped off the blocks of life and had groveled. And now I was stepping back up onto the blocks of life and ready to go face whatever, you know, was ahead. And so that was really it. I mean, I had help. Um, I didn't necessarily ask for it. It was kind of forced upon me, but it was the best thing because I probably wouldn't have reached out if it wasn't for the intervention. So wow. here I am. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Before we go to the new Carling, just let me summarize some things that I took note of. I don't know if you noted, mm -hmm. but help. Some, some people are so afraid to be helped. You know, yeah. uh, uh, it's to have help in life is so amazing. But the only because it was you didn't ask for it, but you accepted. You see, I accepted it. Yeah, uh, and that is important because some people they don't just they just run away from it. Okay, and another word you mentioned is no hope. If you don't have hope, you don't you have nothing because right. you've been there where you don't have any hope. And I and I really believe that. Uh, I heard somewhere that having hope in the future gives you strength in the present. Oh, that's okay? beautiful. Because you are really going somewhere and doing what you're doing be because of something bigger, because of a vision that you have. Uh, and another thing that I took note is that you had to recognize. You had to yeah. recognize I'm an al alcoholic, I have a problem, and I need to change it. It's, it's, a, it's interesting, but talk to us a, a, the good thing now, the good part. Yeah. Who's coming oh. today? She's the rock star. <laughs> the <home> star. <laughs> well, well, you know, it, it's funny that you say that because the world can see me that way. But, you know, so many times, you know, I still kind of feel like, wow, I'm just an ex-drunk. You know, just a very blessed ex-drunk that's been given a second chance. And, you know, back to what you were saying about getting help. We, we perceive asking for help as a weakness and it actually is a sign of strength. And because when we admit that we are broken and that we need help, we need assistance. In other words, like, you know, I, my best thinking got me where I was. So we clearly don't need to consider my thinking. We need to do something different. We need to be open to change. And that's really hard for people because change is very fearful, but most likely people move to change when there's a, a huge amount of pain involved, not just a little amount of pain, 
because that started a long time ago. The pain get getting bigger and bigger and bigger until the point where it's unmanageable and then you realize you have to do something about it. Ideally, if you can get to move to change before things get so bad, before you're near death, before you're homeless, before your your wife's kicked you out and you've lost your job and you're living in your car and, and no, 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 you're good. You don't need help. Of course you need help. We all need help. We need each other. You know, we need each other. Just like when you and I are training together, which I foresee we're going to get a chance to do, we're going to rely on each other for support. We're going to rely on each other for encouragement. We're going to rely on each other because you said you're going to show up, so I'm going to show up. We need each other. We are interdependent, not independent creatures. And that interdependence gives us that humanness. We belong together. And one thing that has brought me to you is the most obvious thing is the water. The water has connected us. And, and it connects so many people that we know, and it's a beautiful gift that we get to share. And when I returned to the water, um, I was very sick. I mean, I barely could swim three or four lengths of a pool without having to stop. I mean, I was not just out of shape. I was very unwell. But, you know, one thing about the water, when I got back in, it didn't look at me and say, you know, Carlin, you really screwed up. I mean, you took it really far. You know, you were moments from dying. Do you really, is that, no, the water didn't say that. The water just said, come back in. I can heal you. I can make you feel better. Forget about trying to swim fast. Just come in. Let me embrace you. Let me hold you. Let me make you feel like you're okay. And that's how I got back into swimming. Not to break records, not to be a big grand anything. It was just to get healed. And it worked. And then as a result, I started swimming pretty darn fast. <laughs> <laughs> you are a lightning. You are, you are a lightning. Uh, tell us a little bit how many world records do you have and, and about your induction to the Swimmers Hall of Fame, please. So they, yeah, that was they, cool. They know what kind well, of best drop they, they are talking to. <laughs> they are listening. <laughs> uh, well, so when I was about four months sober, I was I actually set my very – my second world record i actually sent a world set a world record when i was uh, actively drinking but i was talented enough to pull it off and you know to go back to that talent thing we talked about it, most people think that talent is a good thing you know it, but talent is a good thing when it's expressed but a lot of people don't want their talent a lot of people are a little bit resentful that they have something that other people don't have because it gives you an obligation that you need to do something with it. And I can't tell you when I was back swimming or not swimming, how many people told me, Carlin, it's really a shame. You're wasting your talent. And, you know, the more I heard that and knew it in my heart, I was, the more I drank. So we have to be careful around people that are talented because they may not have really wanted that that gift. Um, now I see it as a really beautiful gift. And uh, so to answer your question, uh, you know, maybe 230 world records to date so far over, over um, 25 years. And um, I think that I have eight world records that I think to me, I've set them in every stroke and every distance, which is pretty unusual. But um, there are records that are 20 years old still on the books. And that's really what's pretty cool is that when I broke those records, they're standing the test of time. And so, um, and that's with Olympians and people coming into the sport and, and going after them. And, you know, I just, to me, it was being sober was the gift. The you records were icing on the train cake. Those guys to see if they can break them. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's, here's a funny story about like my best event was the 200 meter backstroke. So one year in all of the United States in the top 10 times, all men and women of any age, only one male who was 30 to or 25 to 29 had a faster time than me. And that was, that was in the, been entire, the guys too. All, all the guys too, <laughs> which they're not happy about, but, <laughs> but it, but like I said, it's a gift and I've honed that gift and, and I'm very blessed to have that gift. So um, the induction into the hall of fame was really, um, you know, the pinnacle of your career uh, because uh, it's a very exclusive club to join. 12 to 14 people per year are inducted. Uh, since 
the 1965 when it started, only five other master swimmers have been inducted, five or six, something like that. It's a very small number, but um, it's, and the way that they select this is it comes from all the aquatic sports. So it's swimming, diving, water polo, synchronized swimming, open water swimming, coaching, and then pioneer contributions. So people that came from the past that were pioneers. So you're, you're, you have to, have a pretty space to get in there and and i and i did and i was i mean it was just un unbelievable to to reach that yeah. level and to be acknowledged well uh we, you can go we, visit we, you can go visit me yeah. and i congratulate you uh most of the people uh, that watch our channel my, my channel and, and our webinars they are not swimmers they are more into entrepreneurial my in the entrepreneurial mindset but i wanted to to interview you because one of the things that I want to share with people that are watching us is that success principles are all the same. It doesn't matter if, you, if to get uh, well uh, out of addiction or is to build a business or to uh, be a world-class sport uh, athlete. Success principles are all the same. And you, I said before, you were talking about help that we, with coaching in, the, in our case. You yep. sort of recognize where you are, who you are, and, and, and that you have a problem. You talk about having hope. Uh, you talk about effort. Uh, it's, it's amazing. It's all together. I remember the first time I started in this, in this field of personal growth and business and entrepreneurial spirit, that when people talk about a dream or about commitment or about effort, consistent effort, for me, it was like new, but then I understood that mm. it's all the same. Do you, do you have something to add since we are uh, already starting to, we need to go? I and mean, you know, I know that you have some people coming into your home and, exactly. and we're uh, wrapping up. Do you have something to add to these guys that they are not into sports, maybe? Uh, they just want to be successful in life. They want to make more money. They want to make an impact around them. And how the same way you got out of addiction and you get to become the great athlete you are, how can they do the same? Can you give them some insight on, on principles that, that you have learned through your life about success? I would love to. And, and I wholeheartedly agree because this, you know, swimming is life. Life is swimming, water, world, work, whatever. I would say that one of the biggest things is people are blown away when I say this. I am most grateful. The best thing that's ever happened to me in my life, not world records, not hall of fame is the fact that I'm an alcoholic. That is the best thing that's ever happened to me. And the reason is, is because if from the ashes, a Phoenix has risen and what it's taught me over the years is there are no mistakes and there are no failures. There's only reframing. And, and we look at what has happened. And, and you know what? Hindsight is always twenty twenty. You know, we don't get that job promotion. That connection didn't go through. Um, somebody, you know, unfriended you that you thought was going to be a business partner or something happened. And you think to yourself, oh, wow, your ego takes a hit. But later down the road, you realize it was the best thing that happened to you. And, and that's it. You take something negative, whatever it is, and you turn it into something positive. You take your weakness and you turn it into your strength. You, you take um, whatever possible. Think in your life of the things that you thought were the worst thing that could have ever happened to you. And now you look back and you go, oh, my gosh, that was such a blessing. And I think that we can reframe that. And, and if you are in addiction or struggling with it, you're already used to reframing bad behavior, poor choices. You have to reframe it to make yourself okay with it. Let's flip that around and say, all right, how do I reframe every life situation and turn it into something positive? Because, you know, we're all on this journey together and it is a journey. It's not everything goes rosy all the time. It, there's going to be struggles, but the struggles is where we learn what we're made of. And I think that we're all made of some pretty tough stuff and we need to recognize that. The last thing I want to say is celebrate small victories. Don't be going for the big brass ring and think that that's the only thing that's going to define you as successful. The little steps along the way are the ones that are going to define character, the ones that are going to make you the person that people want to work with, the ones that are going to say, I want some of that guy's energy. What has he got? 
And then you hear he has a story like mine, came back from nowhere. And you go, wow, that's pretty cool. So celebrate those small victories. And in closing, I would like to leave you with just a, some famous words said by a very famous fish. Just keep swimming. <laughs> <laughs> pretty, you know, pretty Dory says, just keep swimming. If you just start from whatever point you're at, pretty soon you'll make some headway and you're not going to recognize it until you turn around and look back and go, dang, I've come really far. Give yourself a pat on the back and then keep swimming. Great, great. I am so, uh, now I'm your biggest fan. You know? <laughs> And I'm so happy that we're going to be together and next Tuesday. I'll be one of the first ones to jump in that endless pool so you can check my technique and get me a faster swimmer. I will be a faster swimmer because I'm your friend now. <laughs> so we're well, you really... know what? What the... I just wanted to say, the uh, you know, what I said is the talent and the world records were um, are, are wonderful. But I really, really, my passion is teaching it to others. And that's the greatest gift I got from my alcoholic dad is he was a brilliant teacher. So I can take my, my passion and my purpose and my talent, my swimming, and I share it with others. Like you're doing with your passion and your purpose, you're sharing that experience with others and creating light and love and opportunity everywhere you go. So thank you so much for having me on the show. It's been our pleasure and uh, I, I'm looking forward to see you in a couple of days. Guys, you just had one of the best swimmers in history talking to you and great great wisdom okay so we with this we say bye-bye see you next one keep following our channels and our webinars say bye-bye carling aloha and bye-bye <laughs>